but they, they don't have the ability to overcome themselves. And I think that's the inspiration of David Goggins is like, but he's insane. So how, yeah. do, how does a normal, <laughs> right. how does a normal right. healthy Christian man sort of tap into that? I don't have any good answers. It seems to be one of those things that God just gives to a man at some day, but I, yeah. I would like it to be something other than that. Yeah. And it seems almost like a first world 2024 issue or, or the last, you know, yeah. 50 year issue, because I think a lot of these questions that we have now, you know, when you, maybe you're not in abject poverty, but you really yeah. are, you know, working to provide day in and day out and you're physically, you know, working with your body and maybe this all goes back You know, everybody, it's industrial age, just screwed everything up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> but before that, when everybody was agrarian and working on the farm kind of thing. Uh, but today I think you have to, I mean, the strenuous life has been popular for a long time. The Te- Teddy Roosevelt way, I'm not, wouldn't be a huge fan of his politics, but I, the pursuit of, of, of physical pain has its place in, I, in dis, I've disciplined my body. I'm, I, I'm pursuing something. And in today's world, the man has to pursue some sort of physical labor, even if he's a white collar worker. And one of the things I've tried to yeah. talk to pastors about is like, man, you're, you got to view yourself as a blue collar worker, not, not an office worker. You're not carrying a briefcase. You've got a shepherd's crook and you have a weapon and you're pulling people in. Okay. So that's the whole thing is you're pulling people back in and you're fighting like crazy. You're a blue collar worker and you got to have calloused hands. So I've encouraged pastors and, uh, and just men in general, you've got to pursue. And I think that's why barbell training or anything like that. It's been, it's been great for me. If men, if men don't pursue what you're talking about, we live in a world that won't give it to them. We we live in a world that will make men soft and keep men soft and want men to be soft and they want men to literally live as our first father, Adam, standing by passively and cheer on Eve as she goes out and pursues everything that we're called to pursue. And so we have to we have to live the strenuous life. We have to pursue this. We have to discipline our body as we discipline our soul and our discipline our life. And that means pursuing. It means waking up today and say, okay, I am going to get a gym membership or I'm, I'm going to run to the stop sign today and, and back. It really matters because in 24, 24, we're not going to get that. We had to pursue it. This is fantastic. I haven't had, I haven't had a conversation about these aspects of masculinity in a long time. And this is, this is very refreshing. So, um, okay. So I think on the farm, <clears throat> like even when, when we were in a, in a pre-industrial era, we were still as men forced to encounter non-negotiable reality. So I read this book <clears throat> recently called Lonesome Dove. It's you know called the people call it the, the, the greatest Western novel of all time. It's like 900 pages, and um, and I think it was written in the uh, early 80s. So it doesn't have any of the wokeness that we really see today. But one of the things that struck me about that book it's about a cattle drive from I believe it's like East Texas up to Montana. So it's sort of through the American Midwest as the as the Civil War has ended and you know the the frontier is being settled. So it's like a portrait of what America was like say 150 years ago. And one of the things that struck me about reading that book is all of the um, all the misfortune that this team of men driving these cattle northwards encounter. So whether it be environmental, uh, like in terms of weather, whether it be, you know, uh, natives, you know, who are uh, native Americans who are at the very end of their, of their era of, of dominance in the West, who are still attacking the white men, whether it be illness and, and all kinds of, and all kinds of terrible things. But the men throughout this book are, are constantly in this very particular era. It's, it's just in America, it's just after the industrial revolution had started, but it hadn't spread uh, westward yet. So the, the men in this era are constantly forced to overcome circumstances that are larger than them. And so in our modern era, now that we have all this affluence, we're not forced to do that anymore. And so uh, I, I think you said very rightly that the modern era is trying to soften us right? It's trying to soften us. And there's no apparent ability to cultivate that edge because there's no risk anymore, right? So so like we're not going to be, it, it gets 120 degrees here in Phoenix, big deal. I go inside, air conditioning turns on, no problem. I don't have to neg- negotiate that. I'm very grateful and, right? So so I, I, I guess the challenge then is how can we create, is it even practical or possible to create life or death edge sharpening situations for men to, to, to help them break out of their own passivity, 
Because I think yeah. we'd agree that passivity is the ditch on one side of the road, but then you also don't want to make embracing the pain your identity like a David Goggins does. That's the ditch on the other side of the road. Mm -hmm. Like what's what's the right dose for this that we can give to the average man? And how can we get him to a point where he's dosing himself rather than God saying, you're 300 pounds and your doctor just gave you a bad diagnosis. You better fix this. Mm -hmm. How do men dose themselves with the right amount of this, amount, this motivation to begin cultivating themselves? Because I think you're right. It is very much a modern problem. It's a thousand yeah. percent a 2024 problem. Yeah. Well, I think for, for men that are doing well, you have to consider helping and bringing other men along and saying, hey, yeah. uh, let's do this together. I've got a buddy of mine, pastor buddy of mine that's in one town over, my, my buddy Mark. Mark Goldman is, I think, 43 years old, 44 years old, something like that. And he's got a group of young guys that are around him. And he signed up for Brett McKay's strenuous life, their program that they do or whatever. I forget exactly. I think mm -hmm. it's just called the strenuous life. And he was uh, doing us. One of the challenges was walking 50 miles in one day. So he got a buddy of his at his church Whoa. and he had been doing some training and stuff, but he hadn't walked. I mean, he hadn't walked anything close to that ever. He wasn't, he's not a runner. He works out, he's in shape, but he's, I mean, he's not training for anything like that. I mean, how do you train for a 50 mile walk? Well, they did it. They walked for 50 miles. They ended with their joints sore. It took days to recover. And yeah. you look at that and you think like in some, in, you know, for a lot of people, they think that's really, that's silly. What, what's the point? Why would you even do that? But in 2024, that kind of stuff matters. And for those two guys that did that, they're going to remember that the rest of their life. But it's also, there's something in them. It's like, I, I, I was built to be strong. I was built to handle and be able to handle difficulty and pain and challenge and to work through these things. And I'm going to, from mind atrophy to body atrophy, if I don't, if I don't make myself strong, if I don't do things that require my mind to make my body keep going, then I'm going to be weak in all areas of life. And, and at least in many more areas of life than I currently am. So there's something profound about that and bringing somebody else along. And so for, for me, what I've tried to do with my, the guys that I disciple is instead of just meeting with coffee, coffee's fine. That's, there's nothing wrong with coffee and face-to-face -face stuff. But I try to give them experiences that are in, enjoyable, but also a physical challenge. So with one guy, we're running. Uh, we, we run together. And he did. Uh, my friend, Ben. Uh, ben, you're getting outed here. He puked. We're running. <laughs> and uh, he just literally is like, dude, I can't do this. And he just puked. And uh, that's good. That, that's that, that's a good thing. And uh, so I think it, it requires bringing other guys along, you know, the guys that are struggling in your life. Okay. Recognize that. And then for yourself, no matter where you're at in life, you got to be the kind of man that, that recognizes there's going to be some guys that challenge me and I want to be around them. They're going to challenge me to be bigger. They're going to be trying to be stronger. They're going to be challenging me to be more godly. And I need that. And then I'm going to be that for somebody else. Is this something that you do with all the men in your church or is it just, is it something that you take particular interest or they have to approach you? Because this seems to me to be a, a modern, a, a modern development of what you know pastors and, and brothers in Christ do. Like we can no longer rely on our fathers to get us to a place where we're all able to operate as a team. And this is a generational problem. I think it'll be fixed in a, in a couple of generations. Um, but now men are looking to each other like, hey, we don't know how to do this man thing. What do we do? Like, we'll just all figure it out together. And so um, and so they're also turning to pastors in some way to help show them that also. And so I, I see that men are being uh, they're gravitating towards churches with strong masculine pastors who can guide them in these things. Um, but maybe pastors don't necessarily know they're supposed to be teaching these things because, as you said, they have to learn them themselves in many cases. So some of these things, like are, are these things that you do for the men in your church, or that you encourage them in as well? Yeah, definitely. I mean, last year we did a we were training for the Murph, so leading oh, wow. for Memorial Day of 2023, it ended with only four of us doing it, but we got it done in under an hour, which is pretty cool. I think we, we were like 58 minutes or something like that, me and a, a few Not other bad. guys. But we had uh, we had a group that was doing 50, like 50 push-ups a day. We moved it up to 100 push-ups a day, and we were all texting each other and all this kind of stuff. That that was last year. But no, I, for me, I, I just drew a line in the sand when it comes to discipleship. I can either work with guys in an office drinking coffee, going over a book, or I can actually do something that I enjoy and that they're going to enjoy. 
And most guys don't have friends in their 20s and 30s. There's this struggle with that. So I'm not saying that with every guy that I meet with, we're, we're doing physically demanding things because with a lot of guys that I meet with, we go fishing. We they, I meet with them at my house. My home office is here. We go down to a pond that's right down the road from me and we fish together. So there, there are many different things that I do where we shoot a bow together. So we get our bows out and we shoot a bow together. And I'm always wanting to do something with these guys beyond, besides just sitting down and drinking coffee. But I'm always wanting to be discipling a group of, a group of uh, you know, three to four guys at a time. And then that rotates. One guy gets a job and has to move or another guy leaves from college and goes uh, back home or something like that. But, you know, we want to always be discipling some guys in, in our church and then, you know, have somebody that's discipling us. And so for me, it's just worked best. Let's do something we enjoy to do. Uh, or let's run together. And instead of drinking the coffee and, and going through the book, we'll just do something we enjoy and we'll still go through the book. We'll talk about it. But uh, for us, that's been, uh, well, if anything else, it's been a lot of fun and guys enjoy doing that a whole lot more than they just enjoy sitting down and, and drinking coffee. Have you seen benefits to this in men's spiritual lives? Oh, definitely. I mean, like, so um, if I just think about our church, we've got issues. We just actually went through a season of, of, challenge. In, in eight years, this has probably been the biggest challenge we faced in the last two or three months. And God's faithful. We he got us through it. We've got our head held high. Um, but as I, so we've got our issues, but when I think about that, when I think about the overall health of the men in our church, they're doing family worship. They are driven men. Uh, they love their families. They have good marriages. They're working hard and advancing in careers and their businesses are growing. So as I just look at what's happening, there's, there's been a lot of fruit. I mean, there's a lot of really great things happening with these guys. They are not depressed dudes that, um, that are sitting on the couch. They're guys that are motivated and they're doing some great things and God's bringing a lot a blessing and fruit. And so I don't know, it's a really sweet season. Uh, there may be seasons in the future where it's not the case. We don't have a, a ton of young men. In fact, we have, uh, we have some young women right now that we need some more young men to be around. Cause we we've like, Hey, there's some great marriage eligible women here that are godly, that are real women. That would be great for some young men to marry. Um, but the guys that we do have, which in our church, we do probably have more overall men than women, but, uh, there's a disproportion young women to young men when it comes to late teens, early twenties, but hmm. the guys are, are doing great, man. And it's a, it's a neat thing to be a part of. So there does seem to be some immediate fruit from real discipleship. And these guys are, are real dudes that love the Lord and they love their families. So you, you mentioned the young women, I, you, you gave the worship work, protect, provide, lead, and love. Did I get all those yeah. for your, you so for it. women, you, you, for women, you said worship work, help submit, fear, nothing, love. Can you walk through yes. those really quickly? Yeah. That was awesome. Well, so for the there's some things that overlap, but they overlap in masculine and feminine ways. So we say worship. Women are created by God. They're either going to be worshiping creation or creator. God has creator rights over her. So she's going to be a worshiper as a woman. And she's going to be living as God has called her to live as a woman. So worship, work, there's a difference between masculine and feminine work. Again, there's some overlap, but a lady's work is always going to be primarily from the home out. So there's uh, the way I've always talked about it is primary, secondary. Anything that she does outside of the home is going to be an overflow of what happens from the gifts, skills, aptitudes, abilities that she has been given by God inside the home. And so you see that priority of primary, secondary in Proverbs 31 where the Proverbs 31 woman takes care of her household. She's not scared of the winter. She recognizes that her, her, what she's making for her household is valuable, but doesn't do anything with it until later on in the chapter after her family is provided for. So then afterwards, you even see these merchant ships are taking her products far away. So this is a literally an international business that she's, huh. that she's, it's just amazing, but it's all coming from the household order and the principle of primary secondary. So work. And then, uh, help. So all ladies are helpers, married or not, they're created to help. And we're already training our little girl, Providence, at Providence, uh, girls are helpers. So she, she wants to help with whatever the mission is in front of her. She wants to be a helper with that and, and help it succeed and to be better and to see it grow and, and all of those things. Submit, uh, submission is a, a uniquely, um, given gift to women where men are called to submit to God. Uh, there's a glorious gift of a lady getting to submit to her husband 
And not only that, she gets to submit to a body of elders at a church as well uh, in a uniquely different way. But submission is a glorious gift. And that's what I've, I've tried to encourage men and women with, Will, is that every man should love the commission God has given him, the prohibitions God has given him, and the limitations God has given him. And every woman should love the commissioning God has given her, the prohibitions God has given her, and the limitations God has given her. So when we think about the word submit, every woman should love it. They should hear it and think, yes, I get to submit to a husband. And then uh, fear nothing is in following in the way of Sarah. She didn't fear anything that was frightening, even calling her husband Lord. She didn't understand. She, she didn't fear hierarchy. She didn't fear anything that was frightening. And there's a lot of frightening things in the world. And we need women who are not scared of anything but God. They fear God. They don't fear man. And so th- this is an action women need to be called out of fear and anxiety. And they need to be called to be like Sarah and to be fearless. And then, uh, so worship, work, help, submit, fear nothing, and then love. And so uh, women are trained to what we think is very natural to love their husbands and children. This is older women teaching the younger women to do this. This That means it needs to be trained. They need training in this. So her call is forever a pursuit of, of proper love in a domestic way, husband and children. And so that's what we're going to be working through with our daughter and, you know, developing that. We're actually doing a series right now on Jordan's, my wife's podcast, Fruitful and Fearless. We're actually working through these right now as we speak. We're, we just went through, uh, let's see, the last released episode was on help. Um, but I think ladies as well, we, we, you know, we're always talking about rites of passage for men. And the default is, well, ladies have a rite of passage built into her body for moving from womanhood or from, from girlhood to womanhood. But I think a lot of ladies are just as confused as the men are about what womanhood is. And she starts her period, but that doesn't make her a woman. And yet (laughs) people think that's built into what womanhood is, but it also is required for her to be trained by these older women, what being a woman is. And pastors are under this great obligation of teaching biblical womanhood, even though they're not women. I don't have to be a woman to teach biblical womanhood because the Bible is authoritative about what, who a woman is and what a woman does. And so I have this obligation for our church, but also I'm working with my wife as we, we train our daughter up in this. And so I think it's critical for boys, for, for men. And, you know, we have three sons. So I've, I've been thinking about this for years with them, but now with a daughter, it's like, well, well, they really need, if I'm going to raise my children in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord, then that means I have to raise boys as boys and girls as girls. And we need to give this, this positive vision a biblical vision of what that is. And so that's what we're doing with, with the ladies as well. Sorry. What did you say your wife's podcast is called? It's fruitful and fearless. So that fruitful. started with so Brian's cool. wife, Lexi, Jordan and Lexi did a podcast of Brian Sove's wife, Lexi, Jordan, and her did about a hundred and something episodes together. And then Lexi started bright hearth with Brian and Jordan's continued to do that with, uh, her and I, and then also some other ladies as well. So that's called fruitful and fearless. And they, she does a great job. It's uh, it's been, been going for a few years now and it's, it's a lot of fun. 